This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan alongside my co-host Matt, and we're back for another Fireside Chat. This is the first one of the month of February, and we're about three weeks out from the trade deadline now. But Matt, the big story this week is probably the resurgence of the Calgary Flames. We had three interesting games this week. Any overall thoughts on the three games? Well, this is how this team needed to respond if they were going to salvage their season. And it's not there yet like they're as of our the recording of this show they're outside of a playoff spot tied with the st louis blues they just have to keep going and hopefully if they can start piling up some wins between now and the trade deadline they can put themselves in a position where it makes sense to be a buyer otherwise they're going to be looking on the opposite side of the coin and maybe perhaps looking at moving some people same place we've been the last couple of years. Pretty much, yeah. Well, let's talk about this week. The Flames started off the week in the month of uh, February after the All-Star break coming back. They ended the Minnesota Wilds' record 14-game point streak with a 5-1 to victory at the Dome. Uh, Monaghan scored two goals, and Brian Elliott made 28 saves for the Flames, who won two in a row to follow their four-game losing streak. So the Flames started to come back here. Um, I don't know what your overall thoughts. I thought in this one, for me, the Flames were really, the Flames were really looking like a cohesive team again. We saw Versteeg and Elliott both looked fantastic this game. I thought Elliott really looked dialed in, and you could tell that the Flames had a break. Their work ethic, their ex- execution, they were all really good. Uh, everything looked really crisp. You could tell these guys maybe just needed a bit of a rest. Yeah, and I can agree with that. They just seem to play like when they're good they can be as good as any team in the nhl it's just finding the consistency for the players to actually play like that with any regularity and we saw monahan continue his hot streak with a pair of goals once they get going and rolling on all cylinders they can beat anybody like the minnesota wild and it's that's why it's so frustrating when they do struggle against teams and like the whole month of January where it was just pretty much constant throughout. It's frustrating because you know that these players have the ability to be a very good team. It's just for whatever reason they can't seem to have that consistency and effort from game to game or even period to period. Well, I'm looking forward to next year. I mean, if this team wants to be a you know, Stanley Cup playoff team or even a team that's going to go all the way to the Stanley Cup finals, I think it's not so much roster moves we need to make anymore. There's a few, but I think the biggest thing this team needs to do is be more consistent. Oh, for sure. And, like, of course, if you add, uh, like, say, TJ Oshie and uh, Carl Alsner, just for sake of argument, like, yeah, that's going to make your team better, obviously. But the guys like Gaudreau, Monaghan, Bennett, those guys have to be better on a game-to-game basis. And, like, Monaghan has improved significantly this season. It's just when, at the beginning of the year, when he was performing so terribly, that's part of what contributed to the Flames' slow start, which put the Flames behind the eight ball, where if they were playing well then as well, then perhaps the Flames are in a spot fighting with Edmonton and Anaheim for second or third in the division instead of fighting for their playoff lives. Yeah, and Monaghan, as you mentioned, he's looking better. He had two goals in this game, um, and the other goal scorers for the Flames were Alex Chase on Derek England and Michael Furland. And, and, you know, speaking of Furland, I thought he's had a great week as well. Can't argue with you there. And it's good to see depth guys getting some contributions. I thought that Matt Stajan played well in both the Minnesota and New Jersey games. and Yeah, I mean, you that's and I what both the... really praised Stajan at the beginning of the season for his play, and to me, he kind of tapered off around November, December, and now I think we're starting to see him emerge again. 
Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And it's one of those situations that a team, like if the Flames do go into seller mode, I'm sure that there are a number of teams that would look at a guy like Stajan. He scored that series winning goal a couple of years ago. He's a quality veteran guy, good in the room, well respected by pretty much everybody, can slot in anywhere. I'm sure that if that's how it went, that the Flames may be able to move him if they decide to go into full seller mode. Yeah, I don't know. I think the Flames might keep him just for exposure because they need to expose so many guys that played this season. True. Um, I just don't know you're going to get enough for him to really make that a must-do at the deadline. Um, looking at the stats in this game, not a whole lot of interesting stats. The Flames had more shots on goals. Obviously, they won the game. That's usually the way it works. Um, the Wild beat us on the face-off percentage, 60 to 40%. And as we've seen for most of the year, when the Flames take less penalties, the Flames win. They had eight minutes to the Wild's 10. So, so it was, you know, about what we expected for the Flames in this one. Then the Flames went on the road. They started their Eastern Conference swing, and they were in the Prudential Center in New Jersey, where Michael Backlund scored at 113 into overtime to give the Flames a 4-3 to win against the Devils. Matt, overall thoughts on this game? I thought that the only reason why this game went to overtime was the sloppy play from both Dennis Weidman and Brian Elliott. And uh, honestly, if it was me, I would not have given Elliott the Rangers game. The three goals that he allowed in the second period, like he made one minor mistake which allowed a scoring chance that did not go in and he seemed to lose himself in the aftermath and like the flames kind of got lucky to get a point out of that, even though yeah, they, they were dominating the game for the first like 30 minutes. But at the same time, credit to Gullitson who promised after the all-star break that if you win, you continue. Oh, I'm, I can agree with that. It's just in terms of instinct on like, it, he, he just did not seem comfortable in there. And when you're going up against a team like the Rangers and you've got a goalie that's a little shaky, uh, I wouldn't have done that. But, you know, it is a good thing that he did follow through on it. But we saw what happened in New York on Sunday. So, yeah. Well, I mean, looking at the Devils game, this was a, I don't know, this was an interesting game. I thought Christopher Stieg looked fantastic in this game as he has all week. He opened the score. He uh, opened second period scoring, even though Monahan got his nineteenth in the first. Staging, like you mentioned, came through with a big goal, his fifth of the season on this one. But yeah, I don't know. It was a weird game against the Devils. The Flames just they played an okay game. I just didn't think that it was as complete as the Minnesota or the uh, Rangers game. No, and if you look back to the last time we played New Jersey in the Saddle Dome a couple of weeks ago. It was very much the same kind of game where each team had some push at various points and it was a close game. It ended up being a one goal game. And this was very much that same kind of thing. The Flames dominated the first half. New Jersey controlled the play for the last half of the second period and then the Flames turned it on the rest of the way. So, so it's interesting to see. Sometimes I wonder if, you know, when you don't see a team that often, like the Rangers, like the Devils, it's just hard to scout that team because you don't really know what they're about. And maybe that's why sometimes we see these, you know, these kind of awkward matchups against Eastern Conference teams. Yeah, I can agree with that. And it's then, one of those things that, especially if you've only got one or two players that you're even familiar with at all for playing in your division like Camilleri and Taylor Hall like okay yeah you know what those guys are about but every, you know like say like uh Wood you wouldn't know him from any of the other guys or you know any of their depth players you wouldn't really understand their game because you've just never seen them yeah so I think it's sort of like a pitcher in baseball going from the National League to the American League. He can confuse a lot of people because they don't know what he throws. For sure. 
And I think that leads a lot into the last game of the week, the one that was on Super Bowl Sunday. It was a matinee game, which the Flames traditionally don't do well in. And they were on Broadway, taking on the Broadway Blue Shirts. The Flames lost, unfortunately, 4-3 to three to the Rangers in this one. And as weird as it sounds, Matt, I'm okay with this loss. Like, oh, I, if you would have said to me that the Flames would have got four out of the six points, I would have been, okay, sure, great, awesome. But so, not just the four, just the way they played, I'm okay with this loss. Yeah. The Rangers are a good team. We don't see them enough, like you mentioned. We don't know the Rangers, but they're a good hockey team. When you play them, you can feel that. And the Flames held their own against a good Rangers team. I thought the Flames played a very good first period. And I was glad to see, especially after the New Jersey game, Elliot was really emotional in this one. Like, he was getting really angry at some points. A lot of guys were getting emotional. We had some... You know, some very emotional play on the ice, some chippiness and some scrums after the whistle. And it was just nice to see, especially for a team that's not a rival, that the Flames are putting that much emotion into it. Oh, I know. And like Elliot, he's wanting to restore himself as being an elite goaltender and regain the starting position. And the fact that the sec or the third and the fourth goals should not have happened, really. I think there's nothing that you can do when the puck hits Dennis Weidman in front of him and goes over the glove and then a massive sort of confusion in front of the net for the fourth goal where you've got a guy standing like 10 feet in front of him all alone and unimpeded, like no goaltender, like it's either going to hit you or it's going in. So, you know, I can't blame him on either one of those goals, but... And, and so, like, that, I can understand why he was pissed off because now he's going to be on the bench, and if Johnson beats Pittsburgh, then he's going to be on the bench for another week and a bit and until Johnson loses. So, so what Matt's talking about is the system that Glenn Gullitson put in after the uh, the All Star break, saying that goalies will play till they lose. They'll play a game, and if they win it, they stay in. If they don't, they sit down and. Matt, I mean, I know that he has to honor that system, but after a game like this, if you were the coach, would you want to put Elliott back in there? No, I'd give Johnson a shot because, you know, if you're that, if that's your word, then go with it at least for a couple weeks. But do you think as a coach, like it, maybe you're biting your tongue, going, oh, "I wish I wouldn't have said that." Well, they got to do something to motivate one of these guys to steal the show. Because and after the game with that we've seen from Elliot this week, I'm more comfortable with him against a big Penguins team. Well, we'll see. And if Johnson loses that one, then we'll see Elliot against Arizona. If he beats Pittsburgh, then hey, at least we got another start to see of Johnson, and maybe we he goes on a run again. Who knows? It's just one of those things that. Sometimes you need to kick one of them in the butt to get them going. And the incentive of if you win, you're in, that makes you try a little harder. And especially with Elliot being on the sidelines for a good portion of the season, he's taking it as, hey, I have an opportunity to play if I actually perform. So... It's a good motivational tool, and if obviously, like say, like Johnson loses the next one, and Elliot wins, like all three of the games next week, and then Nashville wins the following game, but Elliot plays well in it. Say it's like a two-one game. Well, then, okay, obviously Elliot's doing really good. Let's just suspend that well then. i think as we get but further into until the season you get you're gonna that have to point. start figuring out who's the better goalie and just play the better goalie yeah well that's exactly it and i think it's just a good motivational tool to allow whichever of the two guys to step up step in and somebody just take the damn job basically and none of this like oh goalie a plays a couple of games then goalie b plays a couple of games that we've seen for the last two and a half seasons like the, i think the coaching staff just wants somebody to take the damn job <laughs> um looking at this rangers game i thought some interesting points out of it uh, probably the stupidest flames penalty we've seen all year 
Christopher Stee gets a game misconduct for not having his jersey tied down. I, the last time that happened was a game against uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, and Alish Kotalik got well, dinged Kotalik for was kind of dumb as it is, but I'm surprised that they would let the guys in the ice like that, like that it wouldn't be checked before they go out there. Well, sometimes it's just personal preference, and if you're not a fighter like Versteeg, then, you know, you're not expect. You know, it's just like when Kotalik had that happen. He doesn't fight at all, so but he didn't do did much manage to get into a fight. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Like it, it, if you're not that type of player, like it's probably uncomfortable to some players. So if you're not that type of guy, then why do I need to bother? And unfortunately, Versteeg got caught. And I was glad it. to see Troy Brower get another goal in this game. That was his ninth of the season. And uh, I don't know if that's going to spur him to go on a bit of an offensive role. You hope so. But, you know, if you look at the Rangers that scored against the Flames, Rick Nash, Grabner, Kreider, and Jesper Faust, I mean, it's really the best of that team that scored on us. And for a good Rangers team, those are the guys you expect to score on you. But I think on the other side, being able to get three past Lundqvist is pretty good. Yeah, well, Lundqvist isn't the same goalie that we're used no, to true. either. But we're not used to seeing him. And, and when you see him, you really appreciate that he is still a pretty good goaltender. Um, but we took mm -hmm. 10 minutes more in penalties in this game, which is crazy. I mean, you know, you could see at some point the game was getting away from the Flames mentally a little bit. Yeah. And by the way, like for how much uh, Troy Brower has struggled this year, uh, just as a comment, it if you extrapolate his point percentage over an 82 game schedule he's only five points off of where he was last year so he's a little less but pretty much in line with what he is so you know it's not that so far, big of a deal seven games he has nine goals 10 assists for 19 total points um, I was looking at the NHL stats day too, and I noticed something interesting. Um, we have Monahan, who's now sitting at 99 total NHL goals, so one more, and he'll be in the hundred goal club. And he and he'll be the youngest one in Flames history if he does it before the end of the season, which you got to figure with 20 some odd games that somewhere along I the mean, line he'll been, get he's one. He's been pretty hot lately, so I wouldn't be surprised if he gets it against Pittsburgh. And just as a note is he has more goals this season than Connor McDavid, who's sitting at 18. McDavid has 60 yep. total points, but mostly assists. So just an interesting note there. So, Matt, looking at this week, looking at where the Flames are right now as we record this, the Flames are sitting outside of a, of a wild card playoff spot. They are 57 points tied with the St. Louis Blues and three points up on the Winnipeg Jets. Do you think that we've sort of reset the bad month or the bad weeks that we had after Christmas between Christmas and the All-Star break? Not quite yet. They're close, but not quite. And like uh, if they it over the next 7-8 games, if they win like 5 or 6 of those 8 games, then yeah, it will be back on track. But Unfortunately, there are too many teams that are bunched together in the standings, and the Flames are going to have a really tough go because there's only really two spots that are available to them because they're uh, nine points behind the Edmonton Oilers So for the third spot in the division, so that's kind of out of yeah, reach. Yeah, I mean, if we look at this, LA's realistically. got 58 points. They have the first wild card spot. St. Louis has 57. They have the second wild card spot. Nashville has 58 for the third uh, Central Division spot, but they're right in that right. mix as well. And then Winnipeg so. has 54, Vancouver has 52, and Dallas has 52. So, you know, this is probably going to come right down to the wire, I would imagine. Yeah, and you look at the fact that Vancouver and Dallas have two, three and two games in hand. If they win those, then points-wise, they're right where Calgary is. So it's one of those situations where like Calgary basically needs to go on a protracted winning streak 
sooner than later in order to sort of solidify a, a playoff spot. And the way I look at it is when you have, what, three, six, seven teams fighting for three spots. You have to stay on your game. You but, can't afford to let it get away yeah, from you at this point. It, and then you look at one of those teams has uh, Jonathan Quick coming back very soon. That makes you know a lot of things tougher on you. So, it, like it can happen that the Flames could make the playoffs, but if you're a betting person, you'd slant more to no just due to the fact that there is so many teams fighting for so few I think spots. Right. And especially when you have guys, teams like Nashville, L.A., and St. Louis, who traditionally, over the last handful of years, have been the elite teams in the Western Conference, they have that experience where Calgary has only had that one year, which was kind of fluky. It makes it a little less likely that Calgary could For overcome sure. that. I think as a team, we're starting to see the right play style and the right guys contributing i mean i'd say that bennett is really starting to find its way again he's looked kind of lost for a month or so versteeg's been doing everything well this last week besides tying down his jersey and even furland had two goals and three points over the past four games so i think that we're on the right track we're moving upwards right now but it's going to be a matter of can they keep this momentum up especially with the bye week coming up will they be able to come back after the bye week and keep playing great hockey and that will be the key. Like, it, it, Simply put, the Flames just need points. Period. End of story. And if they're not going to get these points, like especially with the competition over the next little bit, like uh, after the Pittsburgh game, they play Arizona, who's terrible. Uh, they're playing Philadelphia, who is in the uh, one of the wild card spots in the East. Vancouver, who's below us. Nashville, who's one point ahead of Calgary. Uh, Tampa, who's the worst team in the Eastern Conference. And Florida, who is out of a playoff spot. And then Carolina, well, who's out of a playoff spot. If you look at the next eight games, we, so, we can't give up points in four of them. No. Literally, between now and the game against the LA Kings at the end of the month, the Flames pretty much need to win... I mean, we can't lose to them. Vancouver, we can't lose to Nashville, we can't lose to L.A. Those teams we can't give up points to. The rest, Arizona, eh, I'd rather not lose to them, but we can afford to give up the points if we need to to that team because they're not right on our heels. The rest are Eastern Conference teams. It doesn't matter you know, if they get a loser point or whatever they might get, but you cannot lose to Vancouver, Nashville, L.A. because you're going to give them a point that might help them surpass you. Exactly. And... Things get really tight, it, and if they're not getting at least a dozen points in the, those eight games prior to the LA Kings game at the end of the month, then you the team is better off just selling off, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, we've got some time to figure that out, but yeah, Brad Treliving's going to have to probably make up his mind by about the twenty, you know, 25th, somewhere around there. But I think that this break might be a good timing for the Flames. They're going to take a five-day break here, a bye week after the Pittsburgh game, and hopefully it'll get them rested up. And they've got a wicked schedule in March. So hopefully that'll rest them up, fix some of the dings and bruises, and they'll come back ready to play. Yeah. Well, by the time they play the Florida Panthers again, that's pretty much it. So, And, the, and things should be clear by then anyway. Because if the Flames lose, say, four of those games, then yeah, Well, and if you look no last point. year, like the Flames sold Hoodler off early, and that was sort of the opening of selling season. I wouldn't be surprised if, if we make a decision by maybe even the 20th among management, and they try to sell early to get a jump on the deadline deals. Because I think primarily um, the assets we yeah, have are well, defense, and I think there's a lot of more attractive defensemen on the market. Like I don't think any defenseman will move until Shattenkirk does. So that could hold up a lot of deals on that day. Yeah, uh, at least if you got the, like, especially a team, like, if they're looking at Shattenkirk, Dennis Weidman is, like, the cheap plan B, <laughs> if I'd that makes sense. I'd say for most teams the right now, offensive... he's playing, he's the plan C. 
Yeah, well, there's not that many defensemen available. There's only Shattenkirk and Stone. I don't know. I, th I think for a lot really. of teams that are in the playoffs, I mean, yeah, we'll see. He's good veteran depth, but I don't know if he's better than what you've got. True. But there's always a market for D-men, so even if he is not playing so, well. So, Matt, let me ask you this question. Freddie Modine cost us a seventh round pick back in the day when Feaster is here. If Modine cost us a seventh, we've got to be able to get at least a fifth for Weidman, right? Oh, yeah. Easily. I, I, honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames got a second for Weidman. Just because defensemen are always over value so at the deadline like look at what we got for russell last year like if you would have said we would have got a former second round pick a second round pick and a six seven defenseman that's only 24 i think everybody would have laughed and said yeah right for chris russell so it, i wouldn't be shocked if the flames got a second or a third it just depends on the needs of the team yeah, acquiring we'll them because like if you look at edmonton and I loathe to be to deal with them. They don't have anybody that has a slap shot on their defense at all. I think and, Edmonton might overpay uh, for Shattenkirk. If you, well, I don't know as if they'd want to for a rental, like pay what Shattenkirk will give them. But uh, if you look at Weidman there, well, Russell and Weidman played together, and they, they had chemistry for all those years that they were together. So it would make some sense from that perspective, especially because it does look like Edmonton will finally break their drought and make the playoffs for once. It That would actually make some sense. And a late second-round pick to them, yeah, it's a lot, but it's not that big a deal. So if put it this way, that... Of all the teams that are in the playoffs, the one that I think actually makes the most sense as a destination for Weidman is Edmonton. Yeah, we've said that for a while that we could see him go in Edmonton. Um, I uh, earlier in the season I thought that Tampa Bay might be a destination, but they've really fallen hard lately. But you know, looking look. Yeah, right into dead exactly. last. Like, what happened to them? Um, but. <laughs> Glad we didn't pay overpay to get Ben Bishop. For what? sure, but you yeah. know that they'll be selling that... at the deadline now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but if I look at some of the teams that we're playing over the next week, and, I mean, we'll talk more about the deadline as we get closer, but Nashville, um, you know, L.A., even Vancouver, I could see one of those teams potentially making a run for Weidman as well to bolster some veteran depth on the blue line. So we might have sort of an audition period coming up. Yep. Matt, we talked about the last week of Flames hockey, but why don't we pick up the discussion that we've been having about unrestricted free agents with this team? We've talked about the forwards and the defense so far. Now, why don't we talk a little bit about the masked men, the guys in net? Um, we're in a unique situation in that both of our pro goalies have no contract after this year. The Flames went out and had to sign Tom McCollum, a farm team third stringer, just to have a goalie to protect in the in the uh, entry or the expansion draft, possibly. So we've got Brian Elliott making two point five million right now. We got Chad Johnson making one point seven million. We've got some players um, on the farm who are looking good. You know, we've got we've got um, Gillies down there. Even Riddich is looking good. Matt, if you're the GM, what do you do in net next year? Well, for starters, we just look at how each of the goaltenders play between now and the end of the season because. Say, like, Brian Elliott, he's played well. If he, when he gets back in net, continues to play like that, then you look at re-signing him. If each of the goaltenders continue their struggles, then perhaps you just keep Johnson and find somebody else. And with there being a number of UFA goaltenders available, like Ben Bishop, uh, Steve Mason, Michael Newverth. You could probably get Yaroslav Halak for cheap. Didn't Halak clear uh, waivers? Ryan recently? Miller. Yeah, it's just that the Islanders didn't want him in the NHL for whatever reason. But um, there is options available if you're not, and you could also trade obviously for somebody. But there are options that are available 
including just having one of the prospects come up. Right now, do you think it's worth the Flames trading, let's say, for Bishop as a rental at the deadline? Not at all. I wouldn't make a trade for a goaltender at the deadline. Uh, I, I I would be more likely to sell one of the goaltenders than I would to buy one. Interesting. And that, I think, is definitely a possibility. Um, if you look at... I mean, goaltending seems to be a need that a lot of teams have this year. A lot of teams are struggling for goaltending, and I think there could definitely be a buyer for one. And that's where you have to decide who are you going to sell off if you're going to sell one off. Um... I don't know. Looking at back in hindsight, I still think the best goalie that we could have signed last last summer would have been James Reimer. Yeah, but even then, like that's not really a permanent solution. So, like th that's part of the problem. Like right now, the NHL is kind of in a weird spot where there's only like five or six really top notch goaltenders, and then like there's a bunch that might be good for one season and then a disaster the next you know what i mean We're like it, there's no age of the the patrick was and the you know broders and these really i think elite goaltenders yeah like uh, outside of dubnik and price who have shown to be good for a while now like there's not really anybody like tuka rask was good and then he wasn't and now he's kind of again and quick was really good for a while and now he's wasn't very good last year so it's just tough right now like you're just you gotta kind of keep cycling guys in and hope that one of them actually takes the job Sort of like when the Flames, like after they moved Mike Vernon, they tried Trevor Kidd and then Tabarachi and then like 15 other goaltenders I between think there's 15 them goalies and in finding one year, Turk. Yeah, something like that. But that's what Calgary is going to have to keep doing is throwing money at UFA goaltenders. Because I, honestly, I wouldn't waste the asset... Unless you're getting a quality young goaltender like they attempted to with Matt Murray. Like, in that case, then yeah, you spend whatever the asset is. But unless you're doing that, there's no point. And right now, it's just easier and more cost-effective to just spend the extra couple of bucks on a UFA than spending like another second round pick like we did last so year to get a Elliot. Couple questions. I'll throw some scenarios by you. How would you feel if the same tandem of Elliot Johnson was back next year? Perfectly fine. I agree with you. I think it'd be a fine tandem. I think though coming in, one of them needs to be the starter. I don't think we can go with this flip flopping thing like we have this year. Yeah, Elliot would be in my mind the yeah, starter. Yeah, well, making more money so. on day one, and then yeah, I think it'd be Elliot's job to and, lose at that point. No, and plus you have to look at the Flames' defense this year, and we've seen a massive regression in Dennis Wideman. Yoki Paka played steady at the end of last year. He has regressed significantly. And none of the other guys, either Watherspoon or Kulak, neither of them has really taken the spot either. So that has to be addressed. That, like, you look at that fourth goal against the Rangers. Well, uh, the guy was left all alone, unmolested in front of the net, and he had all day to pick the spot and fire the puck yeah. into the net. Well, that's not no. on the goaltender at all and we've seen that a number of times this year where the goaltender is just left but hung out to dry bad as the d oh i'm not saying that i'm not giving them the excuse of oh well the defense is bad but that is a good portion of it and if you actually replace the substandard guys with legitimate players then you should be able to walk away with a better goaltending performance even though, like, the goaltender may not have changed how he's playing. What if the Flames only re-signed one? Let's say they re-sign Elliott, and they're going to promote from within, which I think you've got to start doing pretty quickly here. Um, John Gillies is obviously the heir apparent on the depth chart. 
To me, I think looking at Gillies playing in Stockton this year, he needs another year being a starter in the AHL, at least one more year. I don't think he's going to benefit by sitting on the bench for the majority of the year in the NHL. So how would you feel about saying Elliott uh, and Daniel and David Riddage pairing? I would rather literally sign any UFA backup than have Riddich. How would you feel about in... an Elliott Gillies pairing? I'd be fine Gillies with that. The... I just I don't like while Riddich has better stats I'm just not sold on him being quite ready yet for the NHL like he he does have a 226 goals against average and 922 save percentage and I wouldn't even be opposed to him getting a couple of starts at the end of the season after the deadline if the Flames do move one of the goaltenders I'm just remembering back at the beginning of the his time when we actually saw him in person and he didn't seem to be quite nhl caliber and i don't know i'm just a little reticent to see him facing nhl action full-time as like the to be guy fair, when you and as I the first backup saw him he was new to north america is new to the style game i think that you really need to see him in person again to really evaluate him after one full north america oh i agree that's why like i yeah, well, that's why I wouldn't mind seeing him getting a couple of games if the Flames do move one of the goaltenders, just to see. I actually wouldn't mind seeing both of the, the two goalies get a game or two, just to see what they have at, at the NHL level. Anytime that you sign a UFA guy from Europe, it it's a little questionable cuz like we all remember Red Obara and he was decent but, but he not met very his good. Second round pick. True, but uh, how would you say it? when it comes to goaltenders I don't want to have one of the two guys being an if and a maybe. You know what I mean? Like you need to have somebody that's legitimately competent back there. Okay. So just in case like we don't have a clear cut number 1 that's the problem like if we had a legit number one like a new kipper then sure throw riddich in if he only plays seven eight games that year who cares but you know you're wanting your backup likely to play 25 30 40 games do you really want somebody unproven at all to so be let me the ask guy? you this then do you think that realistically um do you think john gillies is ready to and do you think it's best for his development at this point to play an NHL backup role uh yeah uh, I wouldn't mind him getting a handful of games just so that way he can learn that like this is what you need to do and at I think the NHL level goaltender at this year's deadline he'll be the first guy called up but I just don't want him sitting on the bench for most of next year I want him in the AHL playing hockey no because yeah, because like he's only played twenty seven games since the beginning of last season. I mean, season, as a fan, so... I want to see him in Calgary, but as an analyst and someone who's really trying to evaluate this team, I think he needs more AHL time. He needs to get more professional games under his belt. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and like, that's... if he did wasn't injured last year, then I'd say yeah, he's ready. It's just not quite yet. It. it it's one of those situations, like with Anaheim, when they had Frederick Anderson and John Gibson. If you have somebody who's a legit number one that you know you can play 55, 60 games, no problem, and you can have the the younger guy play 20, 25 games, and that's okay, perhaps that would be okay for Gillies, but uh, yeah... I, I agree with you. I don't think he's quite so ready for that. So in that case, that. then, I think we've both settled on needing two NHL-seasoned goaltenders. Um, Elliott and Johnson is a fine pairing, but let's go through some of the other UFAs here and see what you'd think of bringing them in, and then I'll give my thoughts. Um, an unrestricted free agent out of our rivals in Vancouver, Ryan Miller. Uninspiring, but... Sure, I guess. Is he better than what we got? Like, uh, Do you want uh, to pens? He's making six million now. I think he probably makes about that. Would you rather say sign him for six, or Elliot for let's say three five? Obviously, I'd take the cheaper goaltender. Uh, he I would be Ryan okay. Like, I, 
No, he's just a solid number one. Not a good number one, just a solid number um, one. The guy that I think on July 1st is going to get the most money, Ben Bishop, the 30-year-old goes under at a Tampa. He's making $5.95 million now. I think you're going to see this guy make like eight, eight and a half. Some poor sap's going to pay it. Yeah, I don't want to touch Bishop at all. Uh, large goaltenders that... like. A, I know it's unfair to Bishop, but he reminds me a lot of Jonas Hiller, where, like, the puck hits him versus him making the saves. And, like, especially with the NHL reducing the size of the equipment, I'm very worried that he is going to see a lot of regression because of that. And, like, he's already having a bad season. Add that on top, and, like, I could see him be... A boat anchor of a contract to any team that signs yeah, I, him. I think I'd, I'd, I would just rather pass entirely on. All right, Bishop. I'll go through some other names here, and you just tell me yes or no. Jonathan Bernier, as a backup, sure. Steve Mason, as a backup, sure. Andre Pavlik, no. Uh, do you think either of those guys, Bernier or Mason, you'd sign over Johnson? Johnson's obviously going to be the cheaper option. I'd t I'd keep Johnson ahead of those two. What about um? What about Michael Newberth? Uh, not a bad option, but not inspiring either. Uh, again, a backup. And if you keep one of like, say you keep Johnson, and you sign say Mason or Newberth or any of the those backup guys, that'd be okay. Like, there's nothing. Yeah, terribly wrong. I, I just think with the cost of acquisition and the fact that he's the veteran, we have to give Elliot another shot. I think if you're going to keep one, you'll probably keep Elliot. I think at the deadline, you'll keep whoever you can. You'll trade whichever one has the most value, but you could always bring that guy back in the offseason too. But I think of the two, they'll keep Elliot. Elliot has the proven track record. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you. It's, he is the better track record goaltender. And those uh, are just really the, like everything. It depends on on the dollar amount, really. So, yeah, but I mean, right now they're both pretty cheap, and I don't think Elliot has played his way into much of a raise. He's making two point seven right now. I think you could get him for even potentially less or no more than three million. I mean, this guy hasn't had a fantastic year, and that's maybe the good thing yeah. about both our goalies is you can probably get them for relatively cheap. Yeah. And, like, as I mentioned before with Yaroslav Halak, uh, he's got one year left on his contract, and I'm sure the Flames could acquire him for a bu uh, bucket full of pucks or something yeah, well, like that. Yeah, they could have just like, had him for free. Yeah. So, you know, and his contract's only four and a half, so that's not too bad. Yeah, I, I think Halak would be good. I don't trust Halak to play the majority of the minutes, but I think if you had a Halak as your backup, that would be not a bad idea. Um, another goaltender that I would personally look at who's sort of outside of the top and is a free agent this summer is Scott Darling. I think bringing in Scott Darling is making 600000 right now. Even if you sign him to an Ellie or a uh, Johnson-style deal at like 1.2, 1.3, I think he could be a pretty good backup for an Elliott or a Johnson. Well, it's just like uh, when the New York Rangers signed away uh, one of Chicago's backup goaltenders, Antti Ranta, and he performed well uh, and has performed well with the Rangers. Well, if you remember last summer, I wanted the Flames to go after Ranta. Yeah, and I'd have no problem even giving uh, Darling a three-year, three-million per deal. And I know that sounds a little high, but... His stat record is fairly good, and you know that the Blackhawks can't afford that at all, so. I was going to say, I think that Darlene has shown us that he can play good NHL minutes, too. I mean, he's played 22 games this year. He's looked good. We've seen him against the Flames, and he's looked really good. So I think this is a backup who, you know, you can rely on. Yeah, I think he's one of those guys that you could potentially see him being like cam talbot or anti ranta where they're a backup on a good team they get transferred to a team without a starting goaltender and then they blossom into a good starting goaltender and that's why i wouldn't mind paying darling a little more than perhaps that he should be 
based off of his profile, but I think that he has the opportunity to be one of those upper tier ish starters if he's given the opportunity to do so. And obviously Chicago, they don't care because they got Crawford, so you know they're good. <laughs> so like they just need yeah. somebody to be at the backup. They don't really care who it is. You know, it's the dollar amount. Like he's only getting paid six hundred thousand. That's the important thing to Chicago. So <laughs> Calgary, we have that flexibility. Yeah, so I mean that's a guy that if it was me, I might go after as the Flames and try to bring him in at a decent contract. Um, and Darling, I think the Darling too would be that guy who might push Brian Elliott. Like you said, he's a backup on a good team, but I think he's good enough that he could steal a starting job if Elliott doesn't play well. Yeah, and like if the Flames went in next year with, say, Darling and Johnson or Darling and Elliott or Darling and one of any of the other goaltenders, I'd be perfectly good with that. It's like, okay, sure, we got a decent set of goaltenders. Well, let's see what the other parts of the team that need to be addressed and carry on so addressing some of that goaltending depth um right now we have really three goaltenders i think who the flames are probably looking at as serious guys in the depth chart we have john gillies who you and i both agreed probably needs at least one more year i'd say probably a couple years at the hl level i think david riddich has surprised them with what he's been able to do and then in the echl we have mason mcdonald so going forward, Matt, do you think that McDonald's going to stay in the ECHL? Yeah. Do you think they'll try to pull him up? Do you think they try to deal him? Nah, you just let McDonald stay in the E until Gillies and or Riddich get promoted or moved. And then once Parsons is done with juniors, then you put him in the E and move McDonald up to the A. Isn't it nice to have such goaltending depth? Well, that's why you need to keep drafting guys for each year adding at least one guy just due to the fact that you need to constantly have that supply until you get one of those Jonathan Quick, Carey Price type goaltenders. And you will eventually if you just keep throwing the dart at the board. One will hit the bullseye. It's just you gotta keep doing it. Do you remember at one point the most promising goalie in our system was Leland Irving? Oh, I know. And you can even go further back with Brent Cron or any of the other miscellaneous goaltenders that we've had. It's not been a very <laughs> stellar section for the Flames history. No, it's not. So it's nice to see that they're you know getting some better depth out there. So Matt, here's a crazy idea talking about goaltenders. Um, we saw the Calgary Flames change up their coaching staff this past summer, bringing in Gullitson and Paul Gerard and Dave Cameron. But the one coach that really didn't change, I mean, yeah, we still have Marty Jelen around, but he's kind of the video guy up in the sky. But the one guy that didn't change out is Jordan Siglet, the goaltending coach. And I've been running the numbers and thinking about Siglet lately, and it seems like since he's come in, no goaltenders have improved. It seems like goaltenders are either staying the course or most of them, if you look at guys like Ramo, now Elliott, Johnson, Hiller, are regressing with Siglet as the goalie coach. So I'm wondering, and I want your thoughts on it, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe Siglet needs to go. Maybe he's not the right goalie coach going forward, especially if you're going to invest a lot of money in a future starter. Do we, is this guy causing these goalies to regress, or is it just coincidental? Well, in... When he was first hired, that was when the Flames went to the playoffs, and both Ramo and Hiller played very well that year. And then both of them returned to being the goaltenders they were previously. <laughs> and so those guys can be kind of, ex like, he can be excused for that because Hiller declined significantly because he couldn't seem to see any long shots at all. Like, I couldn't count how many times shots from the blue line would just sail right into the net. But, uh. I mean, Ordeo's in there too. I don't think that we handled Ordeo very well during that period. <laughs> so it seems like there's really been five goalies this guy's worked with. And I'd say that, yeah, we had one good year, but that whole team looked good for one year. But I think that, you know, if you look at these goalies overall, no goaltender that has worked with them since he's been here in Calgary has really shown improvement. Yeah. Uh. 
I, I don't like to pile on a guy when... Like, if you look at, say, Chad Johnson, last year he had a 2.36 goals against average and a 9.20 save percentage. This year he has a 2.50 goals against average and a 9.13 save percentage. Both those stats are fairly comparable. You know, that's just the number, like, I think maybe three extra goals, two, three extra goals extra, maybe not, not even. Like, that's not... That's not that big of a deal. and With Johnson, I'd say maybe he's not going down, but he's not improving. Like, they're either kind of staying steady at where they are, and it really, you know, the numbers are one thing, but if you look at the play, I'd say Johnson isn't playing as well as he did last year, and it could be the defense, it could be a lot of things, but I just don't see what I'm looking for from a from a goaltending coach i'm not seeing these guys you know a good goalie coach will take a young goaltender i look at a guy like a kippersoff and really mentor them and get them up and make you know make them or not make them but help them get better than they were and i'm almost worried about bringing a young guy like a riddage or a gillies up if the track record we're seeing from siglet is that goaltenders are staying the same or decreasing yeah it's one of those things that you can't really, like, as a outside observer, like, you can't see what's going on behind the scenes. And, yeah, evidentiary basis, yeah, all five of the goaltenders have not been great since he first got hired. But that's also partially on the goaltenders themselves. Like, if you look at Elliot, yeah, he's been terrible this season statistically compared to last year. But he also went from an elite St. Louis Blues team to Calgary <laughs> so you know like that does explain quite a large amount of the stats there so I'd almost be willing to give him another shot with another set of goaltenders especially if the Flames do get more UFA goalies and if those guys don't perform well at the start of next season then fire him part way through and get a new guy Additionally, additionally, like if there's somebody who's good that does become available, then perhaps you go that route. So here's another um, potential there. St. Louis, when they fired Hitchcock, fired their goaltender coach. At the same time, he's a guy who's worked with Elliot in the past. Do you bring him in and re-sign Elliot for next year? If you're keeping Elliot, sure. Why not? I'm looking at Siglet, and I mean, his resume he spent three seasons with Calgary's AHL affiliate in Abbotsford. He was with Everett for two seasons. I'm just wondering, maybe this guy's a better defense or a better development coach than NHL coach. I'm not saying he's a bad coach. I don't know him. And when we've seen him at training camp, he seems like he's doing a good job. But I just wonder, if maybe he's better. You know, like there's some coaches that are just better AHL coaches or dub, dub coaches. Uh, honestly, I can't tell you. Because I don't know the insides and outs so on, like, the behind-the-scenes work that he does. Yeah. I mean, if you look at everybody else, yeah, okay, we had a rough beginning, but our power plays turned around, you know, our penalty kills turned around. We can see those coaches making some progress. We can see a new system in from the head coach. It's just if I look at the coaching staff and I look at, you know, Sigla's part, I'm seeing regression. Yeah, and it each year the team needs to evaluate every part of the organization and i'm sure that will be one of them and can this be improved or is what he's doing the best that you think that that spot can be filled then you keep him if there's a better option then you go in that direction we'll see It'll be interesting to see what happens there. I don't want to spend a whole ton of money on a bunch of new goalies, two new goalies potentially, and then have the wrong coach in place and we sort of squander our investment. So I think, yeah, if they're going to bring back Elliott, maybe you look at St. Louis's goalie coach who just got released. If not, I think they really have to ask, is Siglet the best guy? Do we give someone new a shot? I mean, to me, Malarchuk was a great goalie coach, and since that, Maybe it's just comparing one to the other, but Malarchuk always seemed to be a great goalie coach and know what he was doing. And there's got to be somebody else like that out there as well that's un unemployed or unemployed at the NHL level who we could replace. Well, you can dial up Patrick Waugh and get him to come up here. You know, as, as I know you're kind of joking, but a guy like that might not be a bad goalie coach. if he. I don't think he's a good head coach, but he'd probably be a great goaltending coach. 
don't think he would take the job, but you know, you never know. Probably, someone's someone's probably reached out to him at some point. Looking at the next story that we wanted to talk a little bit about was the bye week. This next week, the Flames have one game. They play the Pittsburgh Penguins, and then they have a five day break. And this is the new bye week that the NHL has put in to the schedule this year. They're letting every team take a week off. I believe it's what between December and February, or December and March, somewhere in there. I don't know exactly how how long it goes, but it's it's sort of an odd thing. It's it, I guess it makes sense. You know, players want some time off, and this is really going to even up the games in hand scenario because the Flames are going to have other teams pass them, but I'm just not a huge fan of these random bye weeks for teams, and I wanted to get your thoughts on them, man. Well, we were talking about this briefly before the show, and like I had mentioned that almost it might be better to break it up almost like how they do in the NFL where each team has a bye week and like each week there are teams that have bye weeks. So that way, like it's more spread out through the course of a season instead of just in this like two month and a bit section. So the, the NHL season is what, eight months long? Let's go on average. Uh, yeah, October to April, so yeah. So eight months, so let's go an average of four months per or four weeks per month. So that's thirty two months. Oh, uh, it's weeks, uh I mean. six uh six months and a week. So Okay. So not quite so enough time weeks. for every so not quite enough time for every team to have a, a separate buy, but you can make sure that say one per division has a week off. Yeah. Or you know, you could even have it so like the middle sixteen weeks. I'm assuming the NHL is going to go to 32 teams, so then have like two per week. Yeah, I think it would just suck to have like week two off. Yeah, well, you just like the eight weeks on either side of the midpoint of the season, so like that way, like the first chunk of games, everybody's playing, and then the last chunk of games, everybody's playing, but then there's bye weeks sprinkled out over the middle four months. Yeah, you could do that. I guess I've always looked at the All-Star game at the halfway point of the season. What about you? A little bit later then, but yeah. But if we kind of use that as a guide, I wonder if it would almost make sense just shut the league down for a week, let's say right before or right after the All-Star game. You can do more All-Star festivities. The players often go away for that weekend anyways. You heard about you know some of the Flames going to Mexico and other places. If it were me, I'd almost just say shut the league down for a week, give every team a bye, and you know at the end of the bye week or at the beginning, either way, is the All Star game. I'd almost do it at the beginning, and then the guys can rest for a week. But it just I don't know. It seems kind of weird that you've got these bye weeks now. Our team might be playing a tired team, or our team might be playing a well rested team. I'd almost say just shut the whole league down. Yeah. I know honestly, like if it was up to me, honestly, I'd just scrap the bye week entirely, but, you know, Well, it it's is a new it thing, is. and we don't know how long it'll last, and, you know, I think this is sort of uh, in response to not having the Olympic break and that sort of thing, and I figure if they want to put it in, I'm not opposed to the idea of having a break. I think, you know, with 82 games over a season, that's a lot of hockey, but I just, I kind of wish it would be fair for everybody. Like, let's make sure that by... You know, the All-Star game, everyone's played roughly half their games and then take a week off. For the league, I think they could make a lot of money. They could do All-Star festivities all week. They could have more sort of... Like, there's so much stuff packed into a weekend, if you look at it. Like, this year, there was the alumni game and the skills competition and the All-Star game and all I know. Like, honestly, like, you could have it set up where, like, your outdoor games, you could have a couple, like, one per day type of thing in that by week. Yeah, but that wouldn't be a bye week then. I know. Those team two teams would have like an extra day or something at the end or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, even if you did say the, you know, skills competition one day and you did the, um, you know, the uh, alumni game the next day and the all-star game and then the, you know, the press conference or the whatever else they're doing that week and you could almost span it over a week, they could make that all-star game a lot better. I look at other sports and other entertainment platforms like the Super Bowl is almost a week long hype up to the Super Bowl. Even the All Star game, the Pro Bowl is a week long hype up to it. Um, You know, I look at things like the WWE. I know it's very different with WrestleMania. They've got a week long build up to it. 
Like, I just think that having that buildup could really help the NHL with visibility. We don't have the same kind of excitement around the Stanley Cup game, often because they're playing so many games in a row. You don't have that week-long buildup to game four or five or six or seven, usually. So I just, I don't know, I'm just thinking that might be the f- most fair for everybody. It's just give it, shut the, le- we, the league down for a week. I mean, in Olympic years, they shut it down for, what, like two and a half weeks almost? Yeah. So, you know, it couldn't hurt to shut down for a week. And if everyone's doing it, in fact, it might even help you because some of the owners could pack that week with concerts in their venues. So that that's just my thoughts on the bye week. I think the idea is not bad, but I think that it's... It needs to be rethought a little bit. But let's hope the Flames benefit from theirs, which is coming up uh, starting on the 8th and going through the 12th of this month. So, Matt, looking at the schedule for the Flames after that bye week um, through February, March, and April, this team's going to have a bit of a tough schedule. We talked a little bit about the eight games left in February, half of them against Western teams and half of them against the East. And if you look at March, they're literally playing every other day for a good portion of the month from about the 9th to the 31st. And there's a lot of good teams in there. What do you think? Do you think that the Flames can keep their momentum through that month? Well, if you look at the next 21 games, which takes you all the way to March 27th, of those, only nine of them are against teams that are in the playoffs right now. And four of those are on the 19th, 21st, 23rd, and 25th of March. So the Flames are playing most of their games it, they're against lesser opponents that are in dogfights in the, their own playoff races, but are mostly on the outside looking in. So like in February, only the Penguins game, the Nashville game, and the LA game are against playoff teams. And you just look at the rest of the teams and the flames if they're going to seize the opportunity to make the playoffs those games against the inferior opponents they have to basically mop the floor with them and hold their own against the actual playoff teams yeah i mean at this point especially with so many games so close and so many teams chasing us we have to be i don't want to use the word but we have to be perfect more or less. can't afford to lose two or three in a row. No, and like you look at the last six games of the season, and realistically, if the Flames are going to make it in, they're going to be, if they make the playoffs, they're going to be clinching in that six-game span. The last six games are against LA, San Jose, Anaheim, Anaheim, LA, San Jose. And the, one of those is in Anaheim, so we know we're going to lose that one. Pretty much. So all of that it's going to be tough. And the Flames basically have to have locked up or very close to have locked up a playoff spot before they hit that six-game stretch, which means of the 21 games, they probably have to win 14 of them. (laughs) So not exactly the easiest task to do, but it's what they'll need in order to actually get into the postseason. Well, if we look at some of these games coming up, we talked about February, but if we look at March, here's the days they play to show people how tight this is. They play the 9th, the 11th, the 13th, the 15th, the 17th, the 19th, the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, the 29th, 31st. Yeah. So they're playing every other day, literally every other day. And if you extend that, that into April, they also play the 2nd, 4th, 6th, and 8th. So it's that literally every other day from the 9th of March right through to the end of the season. And we also play on the 3rd and 5th of March, having a three-day break, and that's when the every other day right through the end. So it's going to be a grueling march for the team. And I think, you know, if you look at these games, there's a lot of games in March against the East. We've got Detroit, the Islanders, Montreal, Pittsburgh, Boston, Washington, but there's, there's going to be a lot of pivotal games here in terms of the Western Conference wildcard race. Uh, Winnipeg on the 11th, Dallas on the 17th, uh, Nashville on the 23rd, St. Louis on the 25th, LA on the 29th, like there's, uh, and LA on the 19th. There's a lot of these games that are going to be must-win if for no other reason than you just have to make sure the other guys don't get two points or maybe even one point at that point. Yeah, it's gonna be a tough ride. And that's why, like earlier in our show, they lose. They 
they have to lose to the east if they're gonna lose yeah and like that's why i was saying like it, earlier that if you were betting you'd bet against the flames just due to the fact that you look at that schedule and it's gonna be tough and like you look at like st louis their quality of competition is the easiest of any team in the league for the rest of the season so that may end up helping them get into a playoff spot so it's not going to be easy for the flames and they basically against any of the inferior teams they have to get two points there's no excuse for not doing so and then holding their own against <laughs> the good teams which yeah it's gonna be tough and will the players rise up or are they gonna recede and looking at a top 10 pick again we just have to wait and see yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens in march i think by april our fate is sealed um but, you know, March is, yeah, it's going to be an interesting month, and I think it'll really show us what this team is made of. Playing every other day, we will get beat down. We will get tired. We will get bruised. We will get all those things that are that happen when you play that much hockey so close together. And I think one of the biggest questions will be how we manage this lineup. Are the Flames able to, you know, keep the same guys in the lineup? Are we going to start calling up AHL players to fill some of those spots for some of these games? because we have guys that are bruised and beat up, or are we just going to try and ride these guys that we have currently in the NHL right to the end? And that could have effects on the playoffs. We've seen in the past where we've heard players played in the playoffs injured because they needed to. So I think, depending on where the Flames see themselves, if the Flames are out of this or see themselves out of this race by the trade deadline, the nice thing is this gives us a lot of hockey to cycle guys through. Uh, a lot of hockey to cycle new players, new goalies, call up some AHL guys and get you know some rest in for our top guys. But this might be a reason why if the Flames do feel that they are a playoff team that they want to go and acquire some veterans at the deadline because there's going to be a lot of hockey here and you're going to want some relief. And I'm, I'm not sure that relief, if you do think you're a playoff team, comes in the form of your AHL uh, call-ups. What do you think, Matt? If you're looking at this schedule and you're the Flames, do you go out maybe at the deadline and bring in some you know, veteran relief, some depth relief? Because you're going to get guys bruised up during this time. You, you, or do you say, you know what, if we need that relief, we can call up our AHL guys if we're looking at making a playoff run? Well, it depends on exactly where the Flames are. If they are legitimately in a playoff spot, then perhaps... Uh, I've made this suggestion before of going out and getting someone like Jerome McGinley. Um, but somebody that's a decent middle six forward at the very minimum and maybe a couple other minor depth pieces. Like, I wouldn't mind the Flames going out and getting a depth defenseman. Not somebody that you would spend more than like a fourth or fifth round pick on, but just a filler guy uh like a ben lovejoy caliber guy just the somebody that's there um just something like that and like if, i wouldn't and if we're out and if we're out of it it gives us a lot of chance to audition ahl guys i mean with this much hockey you could pull a guy up for you know a week he plays three games you send him back down oh for sure like uh, if the flames are out of it and in seller mode then jankowski finishes the season here shin carrick's probably up as well shillington and anderson probably get short periods gillies might like uh, you could just find a whole bunch of people that you could cycle in like i wouldn't be shocked if klimchuk and poirier got a couple of games in and you know have a whole host of different guys cycle through and then it helps you too with resting some of your veterans yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you're not going to care if, say, like, Lance Boma plays every game if you need to audition some of the other kids. Yeah, I, I don't know if Boma will still be here after the deadline. We'll you see. know what I mean. Like, it, I'm just inserting a random name. But I, I can't remember a time when we've had such a busy march and such a pivotal march for the Flames. Like, usually we've kind of known we're either in it or out of it. And I think that really this one month of hockey 
could very easily make or break the Flames. Yep. It'll be a learning experience for the team either way. Matt, let's move away from the Flames for a little bit and look around the league at some NHL news. We know the league is expanding to a 31st team this year, bringing in Las Vegas. And it made a lot of people scratch their heads why they were expanding and not relocating. And it's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next couple years. We now have three teams who are pretty much in dire straits. We know that the Hurricanes' ownership wants to get out. We saw this week that the Coyotes' new arena in Tempe, Arizona, is on the rocks, and the Islanders are being kicked out of the Barclays Center, like you were mentioning last week. So with three teams who are pretty much going to be potentially homeless, do you think now, looking back, that it was a poor decision for the league to expand and give a 31st team to Vegas? They should have moved one, and what do you think the future of these three teams is going to be? Well, I think that... it was a good decision to expand to Las Vegas regardless. The fact that you have several cities that could viably hold an NHL team, like say there have been rumors with Carolina moving to Quebec City, that would make sense. The Islanders, I think even if they needed to play out of the Prudential Center until they in New Jersey for a little while until they figure out exactly what to do, That might be a viable solution until they can get their new arena built, a new arena built, or the old one renovated. And Arizona, honestly, who knows? Uh, You could, if you needed to, I think you could relocate them to Houston or Kansas City. I think they both have facilities that would work in a pinch. Yeah, it sounds like Kansas City is going to be Vegas's AHL team, so they'll probably be using that facility. I don't think you could support two teams there. No, well, obviously, if kansas got an nhl team then the farm team would go away but um yeah so i like i I don't know what the arena situation is but just geographically i still think that see that seattle would be a good market yeah and if you're gonna have a secondary expansion teams i think seattle makes sense it it's just figuring out can't see them expanding again when you've got three teams on the rocks like you've got to stabilize everybody before you bring in a 31st team or 32nd team, I guess. Yeah, well, I think just out of balance, I think that's the reason why they'd want the 32nd team. And, like, moving Carolina to Quebec is no big deal. I don't think the New York Islanders are going anywhere because New York can handle having three teams. So, like, there's no problem there. It's just a matter of figuring out a long-term where do you actually play the games. And Arizona, you could shift them anywhere whether you're keeping them in Arizona, just shifting them in the city, or I think by next this door. point we've kind of realized that the Arizona experiment didn't work. Well, I'm not fully sold on that, actually. I think that having it in Glendale was stupid in the first place, but when they were in downtown Phoenix, it was perfectly fine. The, the crowds were good. It's just they moved them out into the suburbs, and... The attendance went down. I think we'll see the Coyotes move to, as much as I'd like to see them in Seattle, I think we'll see them move to Houston. I think the Hurricanes will move to Quebec City. And I think you're right that the Islanders figure something out in New York. I don't know that Charles, what's his name, Charles Wong, is the right owner going forward, but I think you might see a new team come in and take over that team. Yeah, and regardless, like I think like even if they just played out of New Jersey's arena for a couple seasons until they do proper renovations on the Nassau Coliseum or just tear the building down and rebuild it one or the other, like there there is a viable option. It's just figuring it out. It's not like there's nothing wrong with the team being where it was. It's just figuring out they've run into arena problems yeah and that's just more figuring out the logistics of making it work rather than it being a problem it's not like carolina where there's not really a fan base or arizona it where it's located not having a proper fan base like there is a fan base for the islanders it's just getting it to work yeah, there's a fan base there for sure, and it's also a storied franchise. I mean, the Islanders have some cups. They've had some, you know, really great players there over the years. They've had some not so great players, but the, it's a storied franchise. And if you look really at 
the Coyotes and the Hurricanes, there's really not a lot of story to those franchises. So I think, you know, it's like Atlanta when they moved to Winnipeg. It's like nobody really cared. It was a dying franchise that people were happy to get rid of, and it's had new life in Winnipeg. And I think that really shows the NHL that sometimes relocation, as much as they're always so not wanting to relocate, relocation can be a good thing when it's done right, and Winnipeg's doing really well these days. Yeah, and say taking the team out of Carolina and moving it to Quebec, well, you're, you're going to be going from a building that is rarely above the league average in attendance to one that the building's going to be packed every single game. So, and they'll renew the rivalry with Montreal, which, and Canadian teams generate more than a third of the revenue in the NHL anyway, so it's a win-win. The question then becomes, if you're the Vegas owner... I mean, you know, you're going to have an expansion draft roster. Do you almost look at this and wish that you could have just relocated? Would you rather have a Coyotes or a Hurricanes roster and personnel in place? No, not at all. I mean, the Coyotes, to me, are just spare parts this year. Yeah, like, that's basically it. The Hurricanes, they have the benefit of having a couple of prospects that are actually looking decent. But, you know, that... uh, give Vegas like say two years in the draft and they'll have the same caliber of shiny toys in their toy box too so you know it's not that big of a deal so it's just kind of interesting to see some of that uncertainty we always knew that there was some of it and I think in let's give it five years I think in by you know the end of I just don't think you can move two maybe three teams in you know two years But I think within five years, we'll have a very different-looking Eastern Conference and maybe even NHL. Yeah, possibly. Um, Because, I mean, if the Hurricanes moved to Quebec, that would still be Eastern Conference. Um, If the Coyotes moved to Houston, that would probably still be the West. Yeah, you just move them into the Central Division, and there you go. Yeah, yeah, so that would work. So, and that's why, like, if you moved, like, expanded to Seattle, moved either to Kansas, Arizona to Kansas or Houston, like now each of those divisions, all of the divisions have eight teams, and everything's nice and neatly done. So, it's it's go. a viable way that. to do it. Yeah, you just got to make sure that the market you're moving to is viable. And I haven't done enough research to know if Kansas is still a viable market or not. No. Oh, oh, of course. Like you'd have to figure out all the details, but at least there, it's a viable option to look at one of those two places. Yeah, I think those are really the only places left. I mean, remember when Balsilli tried to do the uh, expansion to Hamilton, or not the expansion? The yeah, the Hamilton relocation. And I really think that there's only probably one viable Canadian market right now, which is Quebec City. Yeah, same here. Or a second Toronto team, but do you really want to do that? So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's gonna fly that well. No. Well, let's let's uh, take a look ahead. If there's nothing else you want to talk about, sounds good to me. Take a look at the next week. We have a bit of a programming note here. We're looking at the schedule going forward and with the Flames bye week. We're gonna take a week off ourselves. It's the sixth of February when we record this. We're gonna skip our show on the thirteenth, which is right after the bye week, because there's nothing to talk about there. And we will come back on the 20th of February, which will give us uh, pretty much four games to discuss in that period. And that's when we'll start looking ahead to the trade deadline as well. So instead of having instead of doing a show discussing one game and what the players did during their week off, we're just going to take a week off ourselves, take a bit of a bye week. The Podcasters Association said it's our bye week. And uh, and go from there and come back on the 20th. So there will be no show next week, on the which will be released on the 15th on the Wednesday. Well, Matt, we had three games last week for the Flames, six points on the table. The Flames got four total points. They got an overtime win and a regular regulation win. And you and I, again, did not fare all that well. I thought we'd get two points just beating New Jersey, and you went for the big goose egg with zero. Hey, I don't mind. I'm glad I wasn't right. (laughs) So, And that's your third goose egg you've predicted this season. Yeah, well. Get overly negative when the team plays as badly as they had previously. There you go. So the Flames, uh, before our next show on the 20th, the Flames have four games. They play the Pittsburgh Penguins in Pittsburgh, uh, 5 p.m. start time on the 7th of February. Then they're off on the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. 
Then they're back in the Dome for two games. On Monday the 13th, they take on the Arizona Coyotes, 7 p.m. start time. And on the 15th, they take on the Philadelphia Flyers with a 7.30 p.m. start time, both of the Dome, if you want to be there. Uh, you can get tickets from our friends at TickTix, which is available on Android or iOS. Great service. Then on the 18th, we take a small road trip. We just head up to Vancouver to take on our rivals, the Canucks. So four games in the docket. That's four games over the next week and a half, really, two weeks. So nice, easy schedule for the Flames there in terms of the number of games. What do you think for the result, Matt? Well, I'm going to go with, instead of picking what I think it, the team will get, I'm going to go with what they need to get, and that's six points. You think they need six of the eight? Yeah. I think they'll only get four, but I'm going with six because that's what they need. So who do you think they lose to? Pittsburgh. So you think they're going to win against Arizona, win against Philadelphia, and win against Vancouver? Yeah, and honestly, I don't think they'll beat the Flyers either, but they need six points. The Flyers are an interesting team. I mean, they're like New Jersey in that we don't see them a lot. We tend not to perform well against Eastern Conference teams we don't see a lot. And they're sort of like I us, do. where they have a bunch of good players and then a bunch of not-so-good players. <laughs> so, like, their elite players are very good. It's just everybody else is not so much. I'm worried about the Pittsburgh game. I think that Pittsburgh can is a team that can really show our weaknesses. Yeah. Um. I think that could be a huge uh, scoring game against Johnson. If they want it to be, I think Pittsburgh can light us up. I'm going to go with four points this week. I think that we're going to beat the Arizona Coyotes, and we're going to beat the Vancouver Canucks. All right. Well, we agree on what we think will happen. <laughs> At least, yeah. so there you go. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Neither of us being overly negative, I think. Yeah. You're You're being overly optimistic, and I'm probably being a little bit optimistic as well um we'll see what happens there but yeah i mean they have to beat arizona that's a must win game if you're playing arizona and you don't beat them you're giving up two points you don't need to give up and vancouver we have to beat them so um you know the two eastern conference games if we drop them yeah it's sad but we don't need those points i mean we do the West, but we just need yeah. to keep the points out of somebody else's hands yeah so we'll see what happens. We will talk to you again on the 20th, Matt. And at that point, we will be about 10 days away from the NHL trade deadline. So hopefully we'll see some interesting moves either before then or right after that. And I think by that point, the Flames will have to decide if they're buyers or sellers. Oh, well, we'll have a lot more information and have a better idea of things once these four games are up. And yeah, it'll be interesting times for the management group. Well, enjoy your bye week, enjoy your week off, and I'll see you on the 20th. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week off, and we'll catch you in two weeks. Take care. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz. <laughs>